I want to be serious. I want to be effective. Maybe because I am Latin guy, I need, uh, need, you know, to be close to the guys. We had the, the decided that he will be the, the next coach of the first team of Football Club Barcelona. And when I told him this, he said uh, that you wouldn't have the balls. Hello, humans. Welcome to the M Word, the Manx Sports Podcast, brought to you by Martin. That's me. And Matt. That's him. Hello, Matthew. How are you? How's your burnt arm, by the way? Oh, uh, we're all right now. I've uh, looked after myself. Pe- peeled your mag skin off. Yeah. <laughs> I've gone back to being pale. What one day out, and that's enough for me for the summer <laughs> now. I've got me can. <laughs> enough vitamin D or whatever it is you get from the sun, apparently. Not as much sun as our guests get. Uh, just a quick shout out to Billboards or Advertise. Uh, Billboards Advertising. Uh, again, as always, check out the guys, billboards.im, the future of advertising. Uh, Today, we're joined by Jack in Liverpool. Jack Walton, thanks for joining us today. No problem. Thanks, thanks for having me. Oh, no pleasure. Uh, just to go back, back briefly, uh, you probably didn't hear the clip, uh, Jack, although um, maybe not even Matty. don't know whether anyone recognised the intro clip, but it was, for, it was a chat with, that I found on the internet with Pep Guardiola about the 10 rules of uh, success in coaching, which I just thought was quite appropriate. Uh, bearing in mind the subject matter we'll hopefully chat about today. So I'll put a link in the footer if anybody wants to pick up any more tips after, after this podcast on, on Pep. I put it in there in great, uh, great difficulty for myself being a Liverpool fan, but we'll, we'll acknowledge that he's a half-decent manager. Uh, so to start off with, Jack, are you a, appreciating you're living in the Liverpool now, but are, from the Isle of Man perspective, are you a come over or a Manx or Manx as the Hills? Or Manx? Uh- I think I'm a come over really. Uh, yeah, my my mum and dad um, are both English, so they they sorry they they were born sorry I was born on the Isle of Man. We'll reverse that back. Um, but my mum and dad were both English, and my dad was a Geordie, and mum was from Preston, so hence the kind of mongrel accent. Um, <laughs> but yeah, I was yeah, I was born there, and then I think I moved. Uh, it was ten years ago in September. I moved over to to Liverpool. So um, yeah, pretty Manx though. I was being born here. Go oh, Manx. Yeah, I, I would say yeah. so. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And uh, growing up, where were you growing up on the Isle of Man? Uh, well, uh, funnily enough, uh, I spent quite a lot of time over on the island in um, February and March. My dad unfortunately passed away, um, and so there was a, a, a real sort of period of, of reflection that was going on, uh, which is probably something that we'll we'll talk about as we as we go through. But um, I, my first house was in Castletown. Uh, spent a bit of time on uh, what's it, Hope Street, and then Mill Street in Castletown, and then I moved to we moved to Colby when I was four, and I grew up. So Colby really was was where I grew up and where I called home. But yeah, Castletown before that. Yeah, I'm only down Ballasalla. Well, in fact, Matt's down Colby as well. So yeah, yeah. Southern Posse catch up. And schooling, what schools were you at, at down here? Uh, Arbury Say, down and Castle here, Russian. But... Oh, right, down okay. there, yeah, 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 yeah. in Castle Russian, yeah, fun, very, very fun memories of, of both. Right. Um, fantastic times. And doing sport at a young age, were you sporty? You know, ah, do you know what? I don't, I don't think I was until, um, well, definitely was when I went to high school. But early on, I wasn't that sporty. I was a, a very rotund child, shall we say? I was, a, I was the fat kid in the class, uh-huh. um, oh. and. Uh, I went to my first, the first experience of sport that I can remember was going down to Colby Football Club when I was about eight years old. And um, we, my dad took me down. I had these nasty silk shorts, uh, gola boots. And we were up on, if you remember the old Colby Football Club, they had the, like the training grass pitch behind at the back end uh, up by Balacroix Park. And it was a, like a seven aside pitch. And we must have been playing 20 aside. The age range was from eight years to 16 I, I still remember the oldest kid was 16 I was about eight we played for two hours 10 till 12 and I think I touched the ball twice size five <laughs> and uh mud bath yeah that, that was my introduction and then got got very much into sport um when I went to high school uh yeah I, I think you've had Neil on haven't you is that right yeah 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 so he, he I'm sure we can talk about him but he's one of the biggest influences on you know why I'm sat here talking to you now Oh, interesting. Okay, didn't know that. Yeah. So, were you folk sporty? 
Um, my dad would say he was, but I'm I'm starting to unravel things. I don't believe him. He had he had a fantastic pair of um the the original Puma Kings. He, he worked out in South Africa uh, as a labourer when uh, when he was in his early twenties, and he brought back these great boots, which are still in his garage gathering dust now. But um, that was yeah, not, about the extent. Not, not of his a speck sport. of dirt on them. No, no. Uh, but my mum is is actually a a really really good high level bowler. She Crown Green and many people who listen to this will remember her Lillian Walton at the time um, she, she played a lot of bowls on the Isle of Man she won the Yorkshire Bank um, which is a big competition that was held over there every summer and she still she, she moved over back over to Preston 95 and it, you know the opportunity for her to play just increased tenfold so yeah. she's, she's not happy at the moment being locked in because normally bowling season she's out at least four nights a week and Two days at a weekend, so yeah, yeah I get, yeah. I definitely get some of that from her. She's, she's very, very competitive, and that, I think I've got that streak from her. That must be a spring, spring, summer sport. Having never spoke to anyone, I don't think that's ever played crown, crown green bowling. I presume that's it. Yeah, I mean, it, it's still, I think it's still quite big on the island. I saw something that there was when I was over in March that there was a petition to save Port St Mary got bowling club, but um, I know there's a, you know, there's a fair community that play it. Um, and it, it is, it, it's, a, it's a good game, you know, I, I learned, I used to play my mum uh, quite a lot in doubles competitions and things like that, and oh, right. yeah, okay. it taught, probably taught me quite a lot at a young age. Yeah, right, okay. And you mentioned you got into sports then as you went to high school. Yes, probably more, more so, definitely. I mean, it was, football was, was, all, it was always something that I played as a kid at primary school, and then not very well, by the way, and then um, <laughs> got, it, it got my eyes opened at high school as to what a, a well-rounded um sporting education was you know matt you you were there i can't what what year were you matt i don't um were, um, you, were you two I, years below me i think i came in 2000 i think i think that was the that's when i came in so you might have been there when i went back to teach there then um i i think you were just after yeah possibly but i think i went there 2006 maybe 07 so we probably just yeah, missed yeah, you, 07, think, you, yeah. Oh seven would have been when I went to uni, so yeah, I think you were, that's, I think. were you my sister. You were my sister's year, weren't you? But yeah, yeah. Right, yeah. So you, we, I, yeah. As I was uh, sort of uh, gearing up to leave, you were just coming in. But I mean, Matt, you know as well as I do that you know the, what the three guys did there, and oh, so fantastic. it was like yeah. what what I've learned a lot. Actually, I'm applying some of the things that I've learned from you know Neil, Cliff, and Guy now to, to in terms of um, fairness with the boys that I coach at the moment. So what? what what I've realised is that um, the rule was if you wanted to play in the football team for the school, that which everyone did, you had to at least go to rugby training um, because some wanted to have their cake and eat it and avoid rugby, which was something that was new for most of us in year seven, and then play football. But, you know, the P staff, no matter how good you were, um, weren't having any of that. And I, and I respect that. Um, you know, hmm. I, I, I respect it in time now, but I really understand why they did that. And that kind of just spread throughout the school that um, you were uh, you were given such opportunities to try so many different sports. I think I, I, I had this conversation with a colleague a while back um, and she'd only played maybe three sports in her whole school career. Um, whereas we were, we sampled at least 14 from what I wow. can remember. Uh, and when I say sampled, that means at least six weeks like a half term block of playing that sport yeah. um, and it, it really was it, it was fantastic oh yeah that's it because I, I was when people say about this um, experiences with sport at school it's like just think of back then it's just it, for us it was just the norm I don't even remember thinking oh I'd rather play this or I'll play that it's just you played you, that was it you played every sport under the sun and got and it a taste of everything and I guess that's why it helps with the um, how good a level we can have how, how good a level that school can produce because they'll then pick out who's good at what and you know the teams and everything thrive on it builds up their their abilities and why well I guess I'm biased anyway from being a cast Russian you know mm. they're always up there in the sports and the people who can you know, who have gone through the guy cliff Neil um, era came out and have done so well. Yeah, I think I was the same. I, I 
I thought it was, I only realized that it wasn't the norm when I moved over here 10 years ago and then realized that for most schools and most adolescents who go through high school, the, their only sport that they'll ever touch is football. Um, and, you know, that has its pros and cons, definitely, yeah. which I'm sure we can get into. Yeah, speaking to a few others, a few other guests previously, yeah, that they all seem to say that diversifications don't get obsessed with one. Yeah. Just, yeah, get that. And, and it'll give you more rounded. If, if you do eventually at a sort of older age, pick pick a sport to focus on, that roundedness that you'll have got from doing other sports will help you. That, was, that seems to be a constant theme. So did you represent the island then uh, at a sport? Did yeah. I read that somewhere? Yeah, there's a, there's a running joke with the, the lads who I play football and knock about with over here. Um, because uh, And in Cliff Dunn, if he listens to this, we'll, we'll have a laugh at this one. Is that, that I, I I'd say you know whenever the lads said oh did you play this or did play that I would say I'm, I'm the, I was the Alaman champion because they you know they've never been over there when it's like but now I think I uh, definitely football I think we might have had rugby when we were in the younger ages did some cross country um, what else did we do there was there were our oh, athletics stuff like that I um, yeah there was certain that cricket I think we had a an island cricket match when we were when we were younger so there was plenty of opportunities at senior level I, I made one I, one senior appearance for the the men's football team I, oh. I was just getting into the squad at the time when I went was going to university um probably for the best actually because there was there was plenty more good players and you know I think I was in right back at the time and there was no way I was going to push Julian Ringham out of that island team uh, uh, I was, was going to say you like uh, is it Carlton Palmer that's got one England cap yeah, the Carlton Palmer, yeah. the Isle of Man. <laughs> Good moment. Actually, there is. Um, I, I was going to do this from my little man cave, but uh, I turned my garage uh, over there into a, a bar. I can show you it later on. But my um, uh, w- when I left the Isle of Man, uh, the the staff at the Isle of Man FA got me a a shirt with my name and number on the back. And oh, it's, right. it's pinned. It's pinned oh, up in the nice. wall. On, oh, on that's nice. Though, isn't a, it? a wall full of football shirts. Yeah. So no, I'll uh, I'll, I'll never forget that. It was a really good opportunity and. Um, yeah, I was absolutely over the moon to, to, to get a call up and play. Yeah, it's nice to represent you, represent yeah. your country, isn't it? Yeah. yeah so you fantastic. mentioned there you moved on to uni, went to Loughborough. Yes. So, so you yeah. did sport, sports and science there, is that? And what? Yeah, well, I wanted to do straight sports science. Uh, okay. But unfortunately, when I got my A-levels, I didn't, I didn't quite work hard enough in the second year of A-levels to get the grades. So uh, that sports science straight at Loughborough was probably the most oversubscribed course in oh. the country at the time. So... But they, when I rang through clearing, they said, well, you can't, we don't have a place on that course for you, but there's sports science and physics if you want to do that. And I, I was you know, you know, jumping for joy. I had no idea that that course even existed because if it had, I would have applied for that one instead. Oh, okay. So that, that was where, yeah, it was a joint, on, joint honours. It was a fairly new course that the university were offering. So, yeah, I, all I wanted to do was go to Loughborough and be around that place and um, people of that calibre. So, so to get the opportunity to do it was great. So that, obviously at that age then, again, I always think back to, and we had this conversation recently with someone of, I had no clue what I wanted to do at that, wanted to do at that age, but I assume you had a rough idea, you know, you had a, a reasonable idea, this was something I enjoyed and this is potentially a career, not necessarily yeah. had a career mind on, but it was. No, it was weird because I, I never actually chose PE as an A-level initially, I, I chose IT and after two weeks, uh, I realised that I, I couldn't tolerant I couldn't handle the, the the way that the course was being taught and that it wasn't going to suit me and my mum talked me into um kind of going with, with my tail between my legs to Guy Smith and begging if I could swap courses and be moved on to PE which thankfully he let me um and then you know university was just something that I guess it, things have changed slightly now but it was just it, what everyone did it was the dumb thing that when you finished A levels you just went to university and all I knew I wanted to do was I was passionate about really passionate about sport at that time. Um, I really enjoyed the physics as well at school, but mainly because those two subjects, I had probably two, two of the best teachers. So hence mm-hmm. they, you know, they, they sparked a real big passion in the subjects and just to be able to do that at, at Loughborough was, was, was a good opportunity. But I mean, I think for me personally, it, it was, I, I didn't have the maturity to study a degree at, at, at that time, having just come off the back of a master's. Um, and knowing what the commitment that you you need to put into to to do a degree properly, yeah. um, but it was still a great opportunity, and I got plenty of it. Be, being the non-university person on on this uh, Zoom call, how where do physics bleed into sports science? Um, the crossover that they sold to us was biomechanics. Okay. 
So um, we we would spend uh, a lot of time in the labs looking at things like for like oh, getting people on force plates and looking at things like um, high jumps and long jumps and things like that, um, discus throws and like trying to study the the maths behind how you can yeah. um, make an object, whether that be the human body or, a, or 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 otherwise, how you can launch that thing as far as you possibly can. So yeah, quite okay. a lot of, of maths involved in it, which I enjoyed that 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 type of maths, but. It, it, it was clear to me after maybe a year or two that I was more interested in the, the kind of human element around coaching and uh, the, maybe more of the sociology as well. So just so Matt, Matt and I are both uh, American football fans. I don't know. Do you watch American football? Are you into yeah, American football? Yeah, I've got a Ravens ball in, inside there. We're oh, well, let's move subjects. Actually, now you can talk about <laughs> I'm not a Ravens. I'm not a Ravens fan. Oh, right. But I, I went no, it's fine. to Baltimore for the um, US Soccer Coaches Conference in January. Um, but I've got, I definitely got into it. I do. It, it so, fascinates me. Um, so when you look at like the draft there, where they complete these short tasks, the high jump, the, the short sprints, I see some of them that it sort of translate to the pitch as in what they do, short sprints, for example, but they do like standing jumps and things like that. And how I, I presume from a biomechanics point of view, you see why they're doing that type of thing to show their athleticism off. Yeah, I think so. But you're, you're only, um, you, you you're limited by what I guess what you can glean from that. I always try to I take these things with a pinch of salt. Yeah. Um, uh, I I kind of understand it's it's very American driven and they they do love numbers and data. Um, there's a it's I'm I'm quite critical of things like uh, SAQ for example. Uh, I don't you know some people hold it up as as the panacea and the silver bullet. I don't see how it translates really that that well. Uh, but SAQ. I'm Speed, agility, quickness. You look okay. seeing people kind of running over the ladders and doing all nice, pretty footwork patterns. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I haven't. I'm yet to see somebody. Uh, well, it's, I'm looking. I'm talking from a football perspective now. Yeah. Um, move, move like that in a game of football, um, what, because it's so um, it's so removed from context when you when you look at opposition and uh, an own teammate state of the game, and you add in all these different factors. You're trying to reduce what is quite a complex thing down to like very simple uh parts and yeah. I, I look i'm sure that um there's people getting paid millions of dollars who will tell me otherwise that you know i'm i'm wrong that that's kind of i, I try I tried not to be but it, it's hard not to be a skeptic sometimes when you yeah. see some of some of these things yeah yeah i'm sure i mean obviously they run i'm sure it has has its value although i have seen chat yeah. in recent years where it's does it need use the word modernizing and, and different dynamics well, or think, things brought I into think, it yeah, I think that um, it's quite interesting. It's, and some clubs are, are changing, you know, the way that they recruit now. So, you know, traditionally maybe that they'll that's the sexy bit, isn't it? That um, you'll look at the, the the draft and you'll look at who's uh, who's doing the thirty yard dash the quickest or who's doing the, the standing jump the furthest. But what I think it, or what I believe is going on now is that they're much well, you know, as interested in the background of the the, the person and trying to understand the person. Uh, as a whole rather than yeah. just the physical element to them yeah. um the aaron hernandez documentary was an interesting one oh, i don't know if you saw that did you yeah, 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 yeah it was incredible but they'd obviously done their home well not, maybe not that well uh done their homework on him but they you know i believe that they do go into a lot of depth and this is something that um there's a good book called Soconomics that's worth a read i think they've done a, a few updates now um by an economist called simon cooper i think he works he writes for the financial times but he he um, made some interesting points that clubs will spend millions of pounds on um, players based on data and stats, and then when they when they bring them into the club, they don't do anything to actually help them integrate. So oh. they dump them in an, or, or leave them in an apartment where they maybe don't speak the language, don't know how to set up the gas, electricity, and water. Um, no, no schools sorted out for the kids or anything. So I think that clubs are seeing these players much more as assets. That they have to properly look after nowadays. Yeah, yeah, no, absolutely. I've just gone on one of those tangents there. Sorry. No, no, not at all. No, you're right, and it kind of brings us back to the that we had a chat on Friday with Paul Power, who's very data focused. But I, I'm sure he wouldn't. You know, I can't speak for him, but I'm sure he, like anything, there's a balance of both, isn't the data and yeah. that, and the balance of you know are they are they, you know and Hernandez is a good example where clearly I, as an observer, the team took a risk on him because he's got these issues from his mm. younger years but they've gone well let's try and 
put them on the straight and narrow while getting the benefits and they've, they've calculated a risk there and you know, I suppose in some ways for the club it paid off for a, a period of time but then eventually didn't pay off the question is did they do it or did they look after him as best they should you know I suppose that's always a debate to be had whether the club could have done more for him yeah um, yeah well, since since they're my team I'll I'll uh, stick on their side so is that your team is it the, yeah, the Patriots yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah yeah I've got a soft spot for Green Bay um I, the first the first place I worked uh when I went to coach out in the states I got sent up to to Green Bay for a week um and that was a baptism of fire go to Lambeau. I, I, yeah I went, well we didn't go to a game but I went to Lambeau Fields for for a, a bite to eat on the Friday night uh when we'd finished the coaching and it amazing stadium even then that was 2004 I think but yeah but got the hat and got the the jacket and stuff and I keep an eye on the glove yeah, yeah. A cheese hat. Uh, yeah, well, Matt's a, Matt's a big, big Pat fan, so yeah, got all bases covered. So, when you finished uni, what was the plan? What was the plan then? I, uh, you know, I. So when I, um, so second after second year, I'd, I'd actually, the the first week I was at university. So everyone, all the, you know, all these young eighteen year olds are piled into a lecture theatre. There's about 320 people in there. Everyone that was doing sports science or some variant of um, hungover, probably. And the the um, sort of head of head of the school of sports science, there, there was a load of sort of in, inductions and things like that. And the last thing they, they finished on was, oh, by the way, as, a, as an aside, we're running a number of coaching courses um, over over the, the, the school year, over the, the, the semesters. If you want to get involved, here's some information. So I, I took, you know, took the leaflet uh, had a look at it and it was um a level two coaching course that was going to be run on campus uh all the way through the the, the the academic year so i thought well you know what's well, a great opportunity i actually rang up um andy wadsworth who was the football development officer on the isle of man at the time and just said look it's a bit it's quite a lot of money but is there anything that you can do and, and he said yeah we've got a budget we'll we'll fund it so I ended up doing my course every year. I think it was like Friday night and Saturday morning for about 12 weeks or so. Right. Um, had, you, had you done any coaching before that? I'd, yeah, I was. Uh, this, this is one of the great things about the island that I, I believe that, that, that is different to, to over here is um, that community club spirit. So growing up playing for Colby, the, uh, the done thing was that or they, tr they really tried to encourage um, the younger or the, the, the first team and reserve team players to go and coach the kids and give something back. So mm -hmm. at sort of 15, 16, when I was, I, I would be playing for Colby men's on a Saturday and the kid, the youth team on a Sunday. But then we were encouraged to then go and like get involved in the coaching on Saturday morning. So I would, I would, I would coach the under 10s, which was actually Matt, I think you, well, I don't know if you were in that group, but the likes of John Cork, who was your year, right? Yeah. So yeah. John, yeah. When John Cork and, and that year were under tens, that was the first year I ever, I ever, oh. I, I say coached. It wasn't coaching; it was bordering on child abuse, probably. But it was it was facilitating football with some children. I would I would call it <laughs> a um, learning curve. So yeah, yes, definitely. But uh, it it was that was my first introduction, and then um, yeah, skip forward to being at university, taking advantage of the level two course that was on offer. Um, and then that then led me out to the States the following summer. So I spent two, three summers working out in the States. And my intention was to, to move out there full time. You know, I've still got friends and contacts out there. Um, and I'm, I flew back. I remember I was not long about to fly back. Um, I've been working out in California. And I get a phone call off Clifton saying that um, the, the head at Cass Russian at the time wanted me, wanted a chat because there was a job that she wanted me to do and would I interview for it so I said yeah okay and the, the intention was I was just going to come back to the island for a few months apply for my visa pay off my student debt and then go out to the states um, but I ended up spending the best part of an academic year working at Castle Russian uh, uh, which is when you would have been at your back end Matt um, mm. as an education support officer and then that that led me to the Isle of Man FA um, and, and you know one, one thing after another I never really intended on, on getting into working for the FA is just kind of things seem to uh, open up in front of me. And those those roles within the, within was that within the Isle of Man FA to start with then? The first one, so the, the first one was with 
yeah, the Isle of Man. So I'd spent the year at Castle Russian, which was just an amazing experience being on the other side of the fence. So I'd, I'd obviously come through the school as a, as a student and then being as a, I guess, a, a member of staff, you got to see, you know, under the, the bonnet, if you like. Mm. Um, and then, yeah, the job at the Isle of Man FA came up and I thought, well, if I'm, if I'm intending on going and coaching, I might as well apply for it and try and get some more experience of working in football. Um, and then that, that opened up, you know, some development opportunities there. I got that job and um, it, I think the biggest thing, that the, the FA nationally were recruiting for coach educators at the time. So the, the criteria was you had to have a, a UA for B qualification, which I'd done by that point. And you had to have some, some sort of kind of educational experience. So I was yeah. lucky that I, I'd had the both at the, just at the right time. So, the, you know, the planets really aligned. Yeah. Um, and that was that was quite that that was probably the moment when I thought this is what I want to do now. When I was you know I'd be delivering coaching courses with with Paul Brideson, who is you know one of one of yours over there, who's absolutely outstanding coach educator, uh, a real credit to the island. Um, so I would deliver courses with him regularly, um, and absolutely loved it. And I, I thought, yeah, this this is the sort of thing that I could I could really get my teeth into, helping teach coaches how to coach. And at that stage, are you, appreciate we all learn it more every day, where you start to develop your thought process on how coaching should be? Because I'm sure <laughs> coaches have their, and I'm sure that's ever evolving with everything, you know, yeah. just naturally is. But did you feel you were starting to get, I use the word an identity within how you coached, just picking yeah, the best, probably, what you obviously perceived as best best things off other people? Yeah, probably. They say that youth is wasted on the young, don't they? And I was probably... Um, uh, had a way of thinking at the time having completed my UA for B and then started coach educating that I was you know probably quite entrenched in this is the way um I, it's only when I look back now you know, I'm a little bit embarrassed but I, I guess we could all say that about things that we've done 10 years or more ago but I think um I, I yeah I'd had some experiences with with some colleagues um you know, influences like Nick Levitt, um, who was instrumental in getting the, the 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 FA Youth Development Review through. So influences like that, positive influences uh, that started to change what I thought coaching was about. Um, and I was I was still practicing coaching. I was I was coaching some kids team. I helped to set up a girls um, set up at St Mary's. Actually, that was I remember doing that. You know, it was one of the last things I did before I left the island. That was really you know, good fun, but uh, yeah, I I probably um, thought that I know more than I did, yeah. and it's only now that I realise, you know, how, you, you realise how little, you know, they, what, what is it that you said? The the, um, the bigger the island of knowledge, the longer the coastline of the unknown. All oh, right. Yeah. And the more that you know, the more you you realise that you don't yet know. Yeah, um, and I probably could have done with hearing that quote, you know, back then when I was when I was working there. I think of that younger age, most people, I'm sure, yeah. we'll probably all get ever go, yeah, whatever, I know everything yeah. type, you know, it's yeah. just, just that's, that's human nature. So the opportunity then in Liverpool, how did that come about? Is that something, did you um, want to leave the island? I, yeah, I think I got to a point where, I, it, it's, so when this would have been about 2009, I'd, I'd actually um, been offered a job with the FA and I turned it down. Uh, and... And I, after I'd done that, I I, I realised I'd made a mistake, and I, I was kind of ready then so at that you, point. When you mention FA, you're talking UK FA here, right? Yeah, yeah, I, I see yeah. them as two things. They might not be, but I see them as two. Different Sorry, things. yeah, the, yeah. The, yeah, you've got the English FA, um, right. and yeah, and the, and the Isle of Man FA. So yeah. I I been offered a job, um, like a team leader of a, a in a coaching role, but purely purely coaching. Turned it down, and then regretted it. And it was at the point I thought, yeah, I I, I don't. I need to move on if I'm, you know, if I want to keep being challenged. So it, it, about a year later, that was September nine, yeah, the job came up with the Liverpool County FA, um, which was still within a development role. So similar to what the staff on the Isle of Man FA do, but I knew that I would get much more opportunity to be involved in coach education, which was kind of like more weekend work, um, yeah. because on the island at the time we would probably only deliver four courses a year which in itself is, is, is decent um, for the population. But I knew that if I moved over here, that I would get the chance to, to get out there and, and be working with coaches on a weekly basis. And that, that proved to be true. Right. Um, so I would 
you know, get into my little clapped out red polo every Saturday morning and be driving off somewhere around the northwest to go and deliver a course for some some county. And it was it was a great opportunity for me at the time. So so and is that full time or is your other work on the side or the other way that, around? No, that that was no my full time job was more of, of the development in terms of okay. um, being office based and the, the kind of behind the scenes work, helping clubs to develop, helping um, pushing through funding applications and things like that. Okay. The coach education was the stuff that I would have to do separately on the side. And that's volunteer um, work. It, well, unfortunately, we, I was getting paid for it at the time. Okay. Um, so, yeah, but I, that was the stuff that I knew that I really wanted to do. Yeah, and, yeah. and so the, the day job, I guess, funded, you know, what the, the more of the, the vocational stuff. But I knew I wanted to make that a career. Um, it was just a case of being patient and waiting for the right opportunity. And when you, when you moved away from the island, what, I mean, when you flick the camera around there, I presume you got a partner. Was your partner there yeah. or did you meet your partner? So your partner was happy to... No, take... no, she's a scouser. Oh, right. Okay. Right. Right. Yeah, so, yeah. yeah, so, yeah so, yeah. so, choice was a little easier when you, you think about family and situations like that and leaving family or, or yes, taking yeah. family with you. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Well, it was, it's double edged really because I was, um, my, you know, I had to, my dad and my sister, uh, and her, my, I think my sister might have just come back from university then. Yeah. So they were, they were living on the island, but then my mum was living in Preston. So, right. you know, I hadn't really seen a great deal of her since yeah, 95. Yeah. So then, you know, I knew that she would only be within an hour down the road. Um, so yeah, it was it was it was pros and cons again, really. So that so that role in 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 coaching then at the, the weekend, you're out coaching coaches rather than yeah yeah okay. And is that age yeah. is that again obviously I'm obviously all football focused. Is that particular age categories? Is that anyone that's just looking to? No, I mean at the time and still uh, we get. Anyone from um, coaches who, who work in the pre- professional game, you know, right up to you know people who, who coaching in who've coached in the Premier League, um, right the way down to somebody who might be taking the under sevens, who literally started, you know, picked up a bag of balls and some bibs for the first time the week before. Okay, um, that was the same then, and and, it, and it's still the same now that you you do get a huge, uh, diverse range of people uh, and opinions that that come through the door and which is great it's really you know enjoyable to, to spend time with those you know with all those those different people so if you took a session would that what would the, i presume there wouldn't be a mix to be typically you might do a session i'll use the word beginners but for the for the one of a better expression you do yeah it. i think i think so yeah um practically you know if we, we're talking about practical on a, on a coaching course i think what i've learned is that um uh, you know we're, we're trying to get people uh there's a really good analogy which is the difference between a cook and a chef so um a cook will basically pull off a, a recipe off the internet um and you know put it together and, and there you go uh, and serve it up but if something you know starts to go wrong a cook doesn't really have the skills to be able to to to, to deal with the situation whereas a chef knows what the end has the end in mind and will work backwards and develop mm-hmm. the ingredients and will and will adapt on the fly uh and able to to do that and i think what probably traditionally, you know, I think back to when I used to deliver courses on uh, on the Isle of Man, I was probably developing more cooks than chefs. So it would be kind of like, here's a here's a ready-made practice that you can do with your players. And that's great. And but once the coaches have, I guess, used them up, then, you know, what? where else have they got to turn? Mm-hmm. So nowadays, I think the best coach educators, the best coach developers are the ones who, um, get you know challenge people's thinking more, yeah. and 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 teach them to think and teach them to be able to um, survive in their own. Because you know the one big criticism of of coach education that, that has been leveled on it for decades is that it's you know decontextualized. That we we bring all these people together and we go to let's say St John's, which is where we used to run the courses, and all the adults run around for each other and we all have a really good time, but then you know, three months later, you're delivering another course and the under eights coach has got 16 kids lined up waiting to take a shot into a full-size goal. And you're like, right, what? I wonder why that's happening then. And, it, you know, you, you, when you think back is that we didn't really maybe give them that coach the tools to think for themselves. Yeah. Maybe yeah. they were too reliant on, on the recipes that we were we were teaching. Yeah, yeah. The, uh, we chatted to someone recently, similar... I suppose almost for want of a better term, empowering 
uh, players to, to or, or arming them with tools to be able to make decisions, you know, do the basics, but also, yeah, the, that empowerment side of, yeah, just, just being able to think on the pitch as well, not just, yeah. Yeah, it's, and it's exactly the same with coaches. Um, I, uh, you know, I started to view things like, uh, I was talking to um, a friend of mine who's doing like a teaching degree at the moment, and I was talking about um, trying to use an analogy of, you know, the way I see the, the, the difference in planning. So some people will, will plan and they've got all this detail, X, Y, Z, and, and, that, and that's great. But I think the best coaches and the best teachers are the ones who are able to, a little bit like, um, you, know, you see when they, they have the round the world yacht race. So that all the boats start off at the same point. But why is it that they finish at such different intervals? It's just that some are able to some are able to respond and react and adapt better to the weather to the conditions that they find, and and those conditions over time you know they magnify. And I think it's the same with with coaching and teaching is that the the best coaches and teachers are able to um, set off with the end in mind and react and adapt to the conditions that that they find themselves in. Yeah, yeah. So so to think a bit into the kind of FA structure itself. I mean, I I go back to. When England were poor at football and there was always this issue about producing English players and the grassroots. So I guess I, I could be wrong, but a lot of what you do now is, is that back of the scene stuff, you know, everyone sees the, the front, the, the, the players at the very end, you know, representing at the World Cup. But I presume you're working on that infrastructure at the, at the background. So it, but I assume that strategy from, from the FA is from the very top of, let's start from the bottom and work our way up of that development. And, you know, you're obviously playing playing up a key role within that structure line somewhere on the way up the pyramid. Yeah, I mean, I, I came into the organisation uh, nearly ten years ago now, and it was just as uh, Sir Trevor Brookin was leaving and Dan Ashworth was coming in, and about six months after I joined, St George's Park opened. So again, planets aligned, um, and you know, Dan um, had a real vision about where he wanted things to go. Uh, he, he, he created um, or he pioneered the what is now known as the England DNA, which a lot of people listening in, if they've been on a coaching course in the last five or six years or so, will have will have heard this expression. But it was basically a statement, a position statement from the organisation to say, um, this is uh, this is the sort of if we want to win or be ready to win major tournaments in the future, um, these are the sort of players that we need to have playing for us. Uh, this is the sort of um, coaching that those players need to be exposed to. These are the experiences that they need to have uh, whilst on camp to be able to deal with tournament pressure and experience. Um, and this is how we're going to have to support the process. So, we, you know, I'm, I'm all this kind of coupled with a recognition of this is our identity as a, as a country. Um, you know, I think too often football uh, in this country, it's very, very well scrutinised. The national team is the most scrutinised team, you know, by a long, long way. Um, I think there's only the Brazilian national team that gets more scrutiny than, than the English national team. And um, I think what the, what this brought was, a, uh, you know, it wasn't to everyone's liking, but as Dan used to say, there's no surefire way to success. But the, the way to failure is by trying to please everyone. This is what, you know, what we're, we're putting a marker down now. This is what, you know, we believe in and it's not going to happen overnight. And there's no point in just trying to be Spain or trying to be Germany or because things do go around in cycles. And, you know, it, it's like, um, it's a little bit like the All Blacks, you know, the All Blacks aren't bothered about putting all their, you know, sharing their trade secrets, if you like. I'm sure they don't share them all, but putting out there because, it, it, you know, they they're what they think is that if everyone's, copying us we're always going to be two steps ahead so i think the england yeah. dna at the time this was around about 2014 now was um was it was a starter marker that, that you know would lead to um you know something for us to build upon or build towards for for years to come which we're still doing and is uh I, I, I've not come across the name before. So Dan, is he, is he a former footballer or has he come from a business background? Where's his? No, Dan. Dan, actually, you talk about somebody who's uh, gone all the way through. So he, he came into the FA as um, a technical director. He'd previously been um, technical director at, or director of football at West Brom. So in that period where West Brom were kind of punching above their weight, 
uh, Dan was uh, director of football then, so he came in to, to do the te- technical director role. And to put it into context, when I joined the FA, um, the whole technical division, this this includes, so I was a re- um, so doing a similar role that I'm doing now, so coach development manager. Uh, you had all the national coaches, all the sports science staff, the administrators, the physios, everything, the whole technical directorate was about 80 staff. Um, so yeah, the, the technical division had grown from I think, 80 to about 350 that it is now. Uh, and the, the team that I was working in was the regional coaches. We went from eight to 40 almost overnight in 2015. Um, so that, that gave us, you know, so much more capacity to, to do, um, you know, to, where, what, to do what we wanted to do with coach education. So, and when that came in, did you see much change in your day-to-day straight away or was it kind of phased in? Yeah, I think what, well, originally when I, when I joined uh, the English FA from Liverpool FA, that would have been uh, 2011, Christmas 11. And, you know, I was a regional manager for the South West. So I was living in Bristol, but I had to cover from sort of the bottom end of Cornwall right up to the top end of Worcester. Uh, sorry, not Worcester, um, Gloucestershire. So it's on the Worcestershire border. But that that in itself is half the length of the country. So I would be, you know, spending probably 100 nights a year in hotels. Um, it was great, in, you know, in terms of a learning curve for getting out and delivering and doing coach education on a, a daily, weekly basis. But it was it was a struggle physically because you're you're going you've got six huge geographical counties across you know across the southwest of England, um, and trying to cover that area is is really difficult. But when we when we brought more staff in, it just enables you to localize things a lot more. So I then moved back up to the northwest, and so now currently I I've got a team of um, six full time coach educate coach educators that uh, also coach developers that I look after. Uh, and, but I'm able to sort of concentrate my own uh, focus on the coaches who are in and around Liverpool. And the uh, are those those coaches going? Are they going into clubs? Are they going in schools? Are they go where? What, what's involved with that side of it? Yeah, our, our work is generally you know we're much more focused now, which is again uh, probably a, a byproduct of having more staff as you're more streamlined and focused. But we're we're focused really our team on on grassroots. Uh, football so that's anything out of the professional game so the, the, the professional academies they'll have staff with the, within the English FA who go in and help develop the coaches within those academies we, we concentrated everything um, from say the, the conference down um, okay. right away from first team level to could be the under sevens your, your local grassroots club still a big scope that's a massive scope still <laughs> yeah yeah it is yeah but it um, at least you know, it's a, it's a much more localised level. So we'll run, for example, one UA for B qualification in Liverpool. Um, I think last season we ran 40 across the country, but then a couple of seasons before, we you know, we only ran eight. So the opportunity, or, you know, and then some people will listen to this because they've not got on to a UA for B and, and disagree with me, and that's understandable because it's their own personal experience. But the opportunity to do to go up um, or to do more in terms of coaching qualifications has probably never been more. It is an investment though. It's, you know, it's time and financial, but, but then I, you know, I've, I can then take eight coaches and, and focus much more uh, closely on those in the local area. Um, yeah. And it, it turns to go out and watch them working with their own players. Um, you know, I, there's, there's, there's a coach who I support uh, who I can walk, I can walk through a session because he lives just over the road and, and you know, they, or the, sorry, the, uh, the venue that he coaches at is literally a five minute walk from my house. So, um, so yeah, but, it, it does enable to, to get to know the coaches a bit more. So when, so when you look at, when you break down coaching a coach, are you, are you looking at, for the one of a word, every element of that from tactical aspects to psychological aspects to, you know, and, and whatever else may be covered within that? Yeah, we, we work off something called a fo- you know our four corner model, and it, it's okay. basically more of a uh, holistic approach in terms of player development. So, um, but it's it's no different really in terms of, of coach development. The coach because the coaches need an understanding of, of how players develop. So we, we, we call it the you know technical and tactical. That's one corner, 
uh, physical is another. Um, they're the two that are probably the most noticeable because they're the things that you can see. And they're the, probably the things that traditionally we've, uh, you know, coaching has focused on. But then we, we, we've got the psychological and the social. Um, and, you know, they are they're the things that, you know, the, the, all these things are connected. You, you can't really separate them. So it's it, you, so you have to have an, an understanding of all these, they, they call them the ologies, um, to, to be a good coach. Um, and, and actually, you know, when you think about it, some, some of the, the best coaches I've seen, uh, especially working with younger players, um, haven't had a, gr a great deal of knowledge of the game. It's not a prerequisite. And what they've actually done is, is gone away and, and learned more about the technical and tactical side of the game. Yeah. But what they are is absolutely incredible with people. Um, and this was a conversation I was having with my friend who's doing his teaching degree the other day. And we were talking about, he, he's, he's doing a, uh, a degree in teaching media. And um, he's, he was telling me how he, uh, he bought a load of popcorn in for, this, for the students because they were going to watch and, and critically analyze some film. And he got down marked off it. And he's, you know, his, his, his argument was, I'm just trying to create a memorable experience. And I'm mm -hmm. sure if I asked you two to think of the best teachers that you can remember, we don't too much of the, the technical content, if you like, but I bet you remember everything about the way that they made you feel and how they inspired you um, mm -hmm. to go on and, and be better. And it's, and it's, it's not too much different with, with coaching, regardless of context. Yeah. I suppose you look at an example, I guess, examples such as, you know, there's a young kid coming in, maybe he's got a troubled, troubled at home, you know, doesn't get much attention at home or, or you know, much, much of what he needs at home. So you've got to perhaps treat him differently in that sport environment, I guess, to, to someone coming in from a different background. So it's, I guess, learning backgrounds of, of where kids are. It might be the only time of the day that, or the week that they actually, you know, they're enjoying because there's other pressures going on. That definitely. And there's it, the thing that, you know, I'm more and more aware of now is that there's, um, it's so it, the need to be individualized everything nowadays all all the best things that you probably um, subscribe to are, will be individualized to you so when you know are either of you on Netflix yeah yes. so you go onto Netflix and, and it will have it will have curated what it thinks that you like it's the mm -hmm. same you go onto YouTube and wonder why that you when you go on there you can't, you, you're down a rabbit hole three hours later because it you know, it, it, it knows what you're engaged with. And I think that it, we have to be a little bit like that as coaches. We have, to, we have to know our athletes almost as well as they know themselves, if not better, to be able to, um, you know, get onto their level and, and connect with them as well as we can to help them, you know, learn whatever sport it is that they are, they're learning. And, and do you see that at any age, at any age for, for in, you know, coaching, coaching people, yeah. you know, from... Yeah. Yeah, I do. Yeah, I think that the when you read or you, you know, read accounts of even at the top level, the, the best players who've played the game, there is, um, and there's there's outliers. Of course, there will be. I'm sure somebody will dig something up, you know, an article that proves, you know, otherwise. You can you can find that nowadays. But the the best coaches seem to be the ones that understand where the athletes, or the players, feel that they are understood. Yeah. And that the and that there is an, a level of trust. You know, there's some um, research out there that suggests that when you're looking at high-performing teams, if you're looking at um, what what is the absolute foundation behaviour that, that that needs to be present within any high-performing team, trust is, is the number one. Yeah. Um, so it, yeah, it's it's it, 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 coaching is a very complex um, and messy human endeavour. Um, and you know it's very difficult to boil it down to um, constituent parts. And do you, when you see, you know, in the professional game, you see coaches coaching, you can quite easily identify those those the traits that the co coach has. And again, I, I go back being a Liverpool fan; it's quite easy for it. You look at Jurgen, who's you know very hands on, seems to be very hands on, seems to have that yeah. bond and understanding with players. I'm sure as many managers do, but perhaps just on a different level to the. So, so you must, I presume, see that when you see the professional game at that top level. Yeah, I mean, well, I think the best compliment I can give Jurgen Klopp is that um, a lot of the my friends over here who are, who are staunch blue noses <laughs> really, really respect him. 
Um, and, you know, the, um, I think he is, he, he, what impresses me about him is he doesn't try to come across as something that he's not. He's comfortable with who he is. Uh, he's unpolished. Um, but I tell you what, I, I think of some of the best coaches and managers that I've played for and that, you know, you, the, the old phrase is that you would run through brick walls for them. Well, you would, I don't know too many people who look at Jurgen Klopp over uh, the, the time period that he's been coaching in this country and, and don't, wouldn't think I wouldn't, I, you know, I would, I would run through a brick wall for that guy because yeah, yeah. Um, he, he does, he seems to understand people and look at the response that he gets from his players. Yeah. Now, obviously he's good. He's going to have an awful lot of knowledge about the game and a team around him that, that support that. But in terms of, you know, a part of a big part of being a coach is being a leader. Yeah. Does he develop strong leadership characteristics? Um, I, I, for me, absolutely. Uh, there's a really interesting uh, theory of leadership that I, I'm keen on, which is called transformational leadership. That that um, is again has a, has a good evidence base behind it. Um, it was developed in uh, across a number of businesses. I think it may have been back in the 70s or the 80s now. Um, but the the principles behind it are so solid for, for coaching and anyone in a position of leadership. And I look at, at Klopp and, and and just see transformational leadership right the way through. Whatever you know, everything that we we see of him. Obviously, we don't see what happens at Melwood, but what, what we're what we're given access to. Yeah my first opportunity on this podcast to plug my other podcast, which I do, which is business focused, but that talks about leadership and those kind of things you talk about <clears throat> there, uh, chatting to people are again in, in business, similar things that, that are brought in and just applied in a business environment rather than a sports environment, uh, empowerment, trust, yeah. those, those types of key, key aspects. <clears throat> yeah. So in regard to the psych, psych, psychology, which seems to constantly come up in chats that Matt and I have with, with anyone sports related, is that an area that that sort of interest to you particularly as well, or or just again, it's part of the overall package. You have a good understanding of it, and again, I guess apply it. Yeah, I think what you learn in in, in coaching in, in a coach development perspective is, I'm not I'm not an expert. I don't think in anything. You know, I'm not a psychologist. I'm not a biomechan biomechanist. I'm, I'm not an analyst. But you have to be, have some element of understanding across a, a wide range um, because, you know, it's it's part of coaching. It's a very much part of coaching. So, you know, the psychology aspect for me is something that I've, um, I've been interested in since, I was probably Cliff Dunn actually, that I remember him delivering a A-level psychology module in our PE course and thinking, I actually remember thinking, I wish I'd done psychology as an A-level at the time because it was, um, it, it was, the first time we'd been exposed to that it wasn't something that was offered as a GCSE or before that, but I found it really interesting. It's something that, that grabbed me uh, and, and has continued to. So yeah, it's, it, it, um, it, it, you know, it is what, what drives us. And it, the, the lucky thing for me is I get to almost see this play out live in, in my own coaching, uh, which I do on a, on the voluntary basis every week or until the world changed last month. <laughs> yeah. So, and, um, in your role then, are you encouraged to do extra uh, development in yourself and look researching what you think might help coaches or are you given kind of a set curriculum in a sense to go out to the coaches and work with them or is it, or I guess on another one, do you tailor it depending on who you're with um, or is it something you said there with psychology with being an interest, you go out and research find things that you think or potentially would could help a coach in need of it and then add that into your sessions yeah i think um one of the best things about working for for the english fa is that um they there is a, a culture of um really trying to improve uh, and, and, and develop personally. Um, so you're when you're down at St George's, you, you you're swimming with the sharks in many respects because there is some really really talented people down there, um, and there is there is very much a culture of trying to uh, improve each other and help each other out. And the CPD that we've been exposed to has been fantastic. So I've just finished um, a master's degree in sports coaching with Worcester University. So we we started that. It was a part time course which was done um you know you talk about contextual learning uh 
the staff uh, at Worcester were absolutely amazing. I think the first, well, one of the, I think it might have been the second podcast episode I did um, was with the two course leaders. One was a previous head of play development at the FA, Andy Cale. And um, so they, they would come to St. George's one day a month with a small cohort of our staff and we would do a full day's taught um, content and then we'd go away and, and work on the tasks. And we were very much given, um, you know, choice and autonomy over what we would submit. So at the, the Liverpool FA podcast was actually a byproduct of one of the modules, um, mm. you know, where we had to create something to, work, to develop some personal skills within. And it was, you know, an itch that I felt needed scratching at the time. So, um, it, yeah, the, the, the organisers have been really good in terms of, you know, pushing you to push yourself because I think what they recognise is that if they've got, you know, better staff or, or more rounded and well-developed staff working for them, then um, we're going to help to develop the coaches. So I, I think one thing that we, we can be guilty in, in terms of our roles of forgetting sometimes is that we work with people who are volunteers and you know we, we live and breathe this stuff 24 7 whereas the volunteer you know might have just come off a night shift and often does straight onto a coaching course mm. hasn't had a night's sleep and has then got to go and take you know the kids the following saturday morning um they don't have the time maybe that we do to then go through everything and then and they certainly well they almost certainly won't have developed the, maybe the critical lens that that we've had to you know when the latest fad is, is out there so i think the best coach developers and even the best coaches are i'll call them curators of information especially in the digital age today where you've got you know masses and masses of information where do you look to and how do you you know what how do you know where to go first and in what order what's right for you and your players at that time and i think that's where you know the best coach developers if if i've got somebody who is um you know i can push content much more readily towards individuals who I think would uh, need it, need it most, if that makes sense. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I suppose, again, you look at that, you're, or the remit, you're given as much, you talk there about, I suppose, freedom to follow. It's only the same, you're doing that down the chain, really, aren't you, in regard to the coaches and the coaches to the, to the, to the athletes. So what, you know, that philosophy, I suppose, ultimately has to start at the top, doesn't it? Yeah, I mean, we only get a finite amount of time. So if, you, if I take a, 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 the last course I delivered, um, before the lockdown was um, they've just built four brand new football sites in Liverpool and they are absolutely incredible state of the art big 3G pitches um, sort of mini St George's Parks so it was uh, literally over the back of the hill right back where next to I live and it was for a club um, the biggest club in Liverpool and one of the biggest in the country Walton and they had uh, 18 grassroots coaches ranging from the under sevens who just literally just started to um, I think we had some under 15s uh, yeah the under 15s so we had right the way a range right the way through um, coaches who coach boys and girls um, and they all come with different things and, and need different things and you know I've got seven evenings with them when you've got you know to, to bring about long-term behavior change over seven evenings is extremely difficult it, you know, or bordering on completely unrealistic but what you can do is um, try and give them some tools so, to survive long enough that they might just be inspired and it might just ignite something in them to carry on learning but yeah. you, you've got to be realistic with what yeah sorry just cut out slightly there yeah sorry? just about yeah realistic Wait. about what you yeah uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, we have got such a finite amount of time with people and, you know, coaching behaviours. Yeah, well, the, the evidence behind coaching behaviours is, is, suggests that what coaches say and what they actually do are very different things. All right, um, okay. You know, coaches will tell you that they coach like X, but the evidence is, it suggests that 80% of the time that they don't, that they're, they're completely different. So, right, okay. um, you know, that that's part of our job is to try and make people a little bit more self-aware about... Um, what you know who are who actually are they as a coach and um, yeah. you know is that is that aligned with the sort of coach that they want to be or indeed the sort of coach that their players need them to be so so i was reading just on that on that subject i was reading about i think you call it reflection and then looking at i suppose you as a coach you'll then look back and go 
you know, correct me where I am here or, or dig in a bit more about being honest about your own performance for, as a coach. Uh, technically, I think it's practical and critical. Yeah. So they're the key yeah, aspects. You, work, yeah. yeah. So they're the key aspects you'd try and educate a coach to. To yeah, do. and the te- yeah, I, you could look at them as kind of layers of an onion. So the 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 most superficial, if you like, is is probably the one that we we spend the most time on, unfortunately, which is the the technical aspects, where which is probably most coaches on the way home will will, will maybe ask themselves, you know, how did the players do, or was the space right, or did, you know, did this game or did this drill, you know, what did the rules work and you know, it's it's important to have, of course, but the sooner that we can get coaches asking more deeper, you know, critical questions. You know, what you know, why do I coach the way that I coach? Um, who who am I being influenced by in in perhaps ways that I'm not sure about? Who who has power over me as a coach? Who who do I have power over as a coach? And how am I perhaps using that power without even realizing it? So all all these questions that I probably um, the, the stuff that we don't often talk about, but yeah. we, we need to, to talk about the, the, the X's and O's stuff that that's, you know, largely superficial. We, and we want to move coaches much more to a, towards a, a more critical conversation with themselves. I, and again, something I read, I, think, I don't know whether it was on an article, article of yours or within it, you talked about uh, in regard to uh, coaching that it's 10 to 15. I thought I've got a no here. I wrote down 10 to 15% of coaching's the, uh, the the learning process, I guess, sat sat in a room for the one of a better expression, and the rest is kind of on the job practical. Is that that kind of right? How I've quoted you there, have I misquoted you slightly there? Oh, two seconds. There. I think I'm just breaking it. Yeah, can you hear yeah, me? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, do you want to just repeat that? Again? Yeah. Sorry, so I was reading a, reading an article, and it talked about. Uh, the, the coach's experience and the coach's own development and only 10, 10 to 15% of it is kind of, I call it practical learning, not necessarily sat in a room, but that kind of learning and the rest is more, I guess, like again, I call it on the job training yeah. or on the job yeah. learning. Sorry. It, I, it wasn't an article I'd wrote, was it? Uh, I can't remember where I read it. I hope not. Uh, no. no. Any, anytime I see numbers flashed up against learning, right. I, you know, the panic buttons started to get pressed. Okay. But I think what we, we do recognize is that, you know coaching is a practical endeavor to to learn to coach you need to spend time in the trenches actually coaching there's only so much that a coaching course can do um yeah. I, and i and i think one of the things that is it, you know we need to push more or coaches who are out there on whatever course that they they if they do go on a course it's an opportunity that you might not get, get again to directly connect with other coaches in within your sort of sphere and, and add to your your network um, and I, I've definitely benefited from that going through my uh, my UA for B is it particularly was a course where I'm still in contact with maybe half a dozen or so coaches on that course and a strange cohort who some have ended up in one's a like a technical or director for UA for one's an academy manager we've got people all, all over the country um, you know and I'm still in, in in good contact with those people so coaching courses aren't you know the panacea in it but they yeah, do yeah. offer opportunities that maybe coaches don't get otherwise right okay and then for, you, for yourself as well you mentioned or oh, again i think i read outside of football what else gets your attention well, i think i was getting some we talked funnily enough this, this lockdown has led to some strange conversations that we've probably never had with people before and <laughs> one of the conversations in our, in our WhatsApp group was Twitter bios. And I realized I hadn't changed mine for 10 years, but um, yeah, snow, snowboarding, uh, golf, learning, reading, DJing, the latter of which has been poorly neglected until no, right. the last the last couple of weeks, which I've had off. And I, I actually, it's been interesting. I, I, I had all the gear and no idea. And I thought, right, I'm going to knuckle down and I'm actually going to practice what I preach. So apply what I know or what, you know, principles of learning and try and get, get better at a skill so I, I did sort of two weeks solid of trying to get better on the decks so right. it was youtube videos which i'm quite critical of coaches using youtube videos all the time but it would be a youtube video on the laptop on double speed so it means you can get through a quick yeah, yeah. pause straight onto the decks have a go and, and what i learned actually was um just how important play is in learning 
what I mean by that is just complete unstructured messing about um, because I, I, I spent a few days and it was all very segmented and formal and do this video and that video. And then I realized I got more out of just, I guess, jamming. You could, if you were borrowing a music, musical yeah, term. Yeah, yeah, and, that, yeah. and that's something that, you know, we're trying to encourage coaches, certainly of kids, but I'm, you know, having experienced that, I don't think we encourage it with adults to, to play. And, and what that means is it's unstructured, informal, um, just, you know, self-regulated. And we don't do it enough because, um, you know, Matt, when you, you and I went to school or when we went to football club, it was still, it was less structured than it is now. Whereas I look at some kids nowadays and their, their whole week, it seems to be broken up by hour long formalized segments. And, and I wonder if, you know, this time that we're now has been a nice opportunity to reset some of that and bring, you know, learn how to play. Cause I, I think some people, you know, myself included have completely forgotten how to do it. I, I think that's, uh, I think you, you, you're right because funny enough yesterday was, it's totally random in the, in the space of time, but it's the first day probably since the lockdown when I kind of had works up today, things up today, and I just had a bit of time to yourself to do, do something and play, as you say. Uh, but it's, I think it's time. I think the problem with that is, you know, everyone's just, everything's so busy. And I'm sure when you're coaching people, there's an hour session and you need to get what you need to get out. So therefore that, that play time, as you call it, and, and right, we just, as humans, we just struggle more and more because we continue to do more, and take on more, take on more information that, that that ability to just, you know, play is still so important. I think whatever you're doing, whatever it is. Yeah, I, I agree. And we, we've tried to be, you know, I'm, I'm a big believer of, of you know, it, it, time is your most valuable resource. You, you spend most of the time in your ear saying yes to things. And then you realize that you, you, you the latter stages of your career, you say no to more things to, to free up time. But we, we try to get coaches to be a little bit more pragmatic with, with time. So a, a lot of them, and especially novice coaches, it's, it's about survival. They, they, be, you know, they're thrust into this world where they don't know uh, what they don't know. And they've, they've got all these things. The, the session looked great on paper until people started running around on the grass and then st things start to unravel. And it's like, well, what do I do now? And, but so instead of maybe planning for an hour or an hour and a half, you know, why don't you let the kids, or the players take control of the first 20 minutes and the last 20 minutes. And you just focus on 20 minutes yourself. You know, you could, could you survive 20 minutes? All right, well, let's try that. Yeah. Um, and, you know, it, it doesn't work for everyone, but just trying to be a little bit more um, thoughtful about, uh, you know, how we can help these coaches to survive, if you like, out in the wild. And, and just to go back to the point to talk about, I know technical isn't a, you know, it's a small element of it. When we, we when we were chatting to Paul Jones about football in general, when you watch football again, I was talking around again. I speak for Matt as well, just as casual football fans, but watch a game and can see some elements of tactics going on and think we know more than we do. Do you watch football games now? Certainly, at the high level, and uh, I wouldn't, I can't, I, I want to say, do you see it a lot differently from what I see? It, appreciate, and you don't see what I see but obviously with your own knowledge and experience within the game you must look at you must look at games slightly or listen to people in the crowd who perhaps haven't got that that tactical and that 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 knowledge that you have and kind of roll your eyes and think yeah yeah I'm seeing the game a lot different from the the average punter yeah I think so um I think the I definitely don't watch the game like a fan do uh, certainly not when I'm at a ground um you know, I'm a, I'm a Newcastle fan and I've sneaked into Anfield the last couple of times that we've played there, which has been painful to say the <laughs> least. But e even watching your own team, I, I, I can't, especially when I've, I'm high up and I've got the whole pitch. That, that's a really enjoyable experience to just yeah. try to pick apart what's going on there. Um, I don't, I, I think I've allowed myself to just try and enjoy games when they're on the TV. Um, the, the, the wide cameras is a good fun thing to, that I like to watch every now and then when they do have it on but Sky don't really it seems to be only on Monday nights when they do that yeah. Monday night football's got a lot better I really enjoy that there's some really good analysis on there but um, yeah you, you can't you, sometimes you it's it's tough to turn off but every now and then I do like to just you know kick back and try and enjoy the game as a, yeah. as a fan but I, I, I don't try and pretend to know more than I do I think a lot of people have, you know, I hear them posturing and trying to um, claim that they don't you know they've analysed the game to the nth degree, but 
I'm a, I'm a believer that football is the most chaotic, random, complex and unpredictable sport that there is on the planet. And because of it, the simplicity of its, of its rules, I realise the irony of what I've just said there, given the season that we've just had. <laughs> uh, but the, or the laws of the game, sorry to the officials out there, are, are actually quite simple. And that's yeah. why it makes it such a popular, uh, fun game to watch because, you know, often decided on one moment. Yeah. And you, you, know, you, you, the three of us could watch a game of football and see it three different ways. And the, the best uh, people that I know are the ones who aren't married to their own ideas and will listen to how, you know, how did you see the game? Oh, I didn't, I didn't see that. Uh, rather than being kind of really entrenched. Yeah. yeah. Um, so those conversations, if you get the right person at the right time, they can be really exciting. But if you get the wrong person at the wrong time, they just bore me. They really yeah, do. Right, right. And regard to, obviously you mentioned there, you mentioned a couple of times we're obviously in lockdown at the moment, although we're slightly starting to ease off here in the Isle of Man. I don't think it's the yeah, case in Liverpool. So, yeah. 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 In regard to your day-to-day job, are you just trying to deliver some coaching online? Yeah, it's it's been really weird. I, I, uh, I think what we've learned is that, you know, adversity doesn't, Develop character it reveals it and we, mm. some of our staff have just been real foot to the floor and just you know risen to the challenge it's been great so what we're we are everything's on lockdown in terms of physical coach education and, and you know the industry in which we work is basically closed until further notice um, so a lot of, you know the English FA have, have finally it's funny how organizations react because and people even those things that you've always said that you wanted to do are now getting done. So we've always talked about having our own YouTube channel and but it's, it, it, it hasn't, you know, come to the fore, but now it's been released. And I think there's already, it only went live last week and there's about three or 4,000 subscribers already. And, mm-hmm. you know, stuff that's getting pushed out, which is, you know, for me is great. If you want to be on the video space, then you need to be on, on there. So um, we, we're trialing, delivering some, uh, UA for B's, uh, just the tech, I guess the theory-based content online. Um, I was lucky enough to do a, a webinar for the uh, Australian um, Physical Education Association this morning. So it was an early start, but they they used like we're using Zoom. I think there was about a hundred coaches online, and then they the facilitator, who's an old colleague of mine, Gareth pushed a button and we all uh, you know went into separate small chat rooms where there was only about four oh, or five of us right. and then he brought us back and and what um what struck me was he, and any teachers or uh, coach educators listening to this will know what i mean you're delivering something live in a classroom and to bring the room back in when they're all off on small group tasks but, you know, this Zoom solved that because the countdown comes on, you've got one minute left, and after oh, that minute, the room shuts out and everyone's back. So, yeah, you know, right. it's, it's a really good way of, I think it will it will never replace face-to-face contact. But um, I've, I've already, just from being on that this morning, I've thought, if we use this wisely, this could be a real game changer because the other thing is it, it, um, it really flattens the... Uh, the hierarchy you'll know from many classrooms, you know, in terms of adult education that you've been in, there are certain dominant people. And, and as a, as an educator, sometimes it's difficult to, to deal with that. Well, in an electronic environment, you know, everyone, everyone's the same. Um, yeah, it's a lot, lot easier to control it. So yeah, we, and we're putting together um, our level two qualification uh, is broken down into some sort of dist- discrete workshops with, content so we have you know from a psych side we've got a, a workshop on motivation um another one on self-esteem so our colleagues uh in my team have been busy just recording conversations like this um little 15 20 minute bite-sized chunks that we're putting together so to build a, a level two qualification or the content of it um into an online course so it's it's funny how uh constraints shape behavior <laughs> You know, we, we've got a, a restriction like we've never experienced before, but it does make you reassess and reevaluate. And I, I think come out the other side, we will come out the other side um, better for it. Yeah. So two other quick questions. You mentioned obviously the podcast there. So again, we'll put a note, uh, a link in our, in the footer of our our, yeah. our our pod. So that's cool. primarily chatting to other coaches. Is that what's what's the background? Obviously, yeah. you mentioned it came out of the studying side of things. 
Yeah, it was um, it, it, basically just a vehicle to, uh, I guess, develop some own personal skills around questioning and conversation, uh, but and, and also having it as an excuse to, you know, speak to or have uninterrupted conversations with really good people. So um, it kind of spawned legs from there. What I realised was that it, it's difficult not to compare to other stuff that's out there. So there's some, you know, I'm, I'm a podcast nerd. You know, I listen to a lot, um, a, a wide range, but I own, I only really listen to one sport one, although I will, I do need to pick up your back catalog. Um, <laughs> and I, I, I decided to, I, I had an experience on one where I listened, I'd done it over Skype and it was, um, it, it was good, but I found it really, really difficult. So I, I just made the decision to go, unless I'm doing it in person, yeah. I'm, I'm probably not going to do it in, in here, but, it's a good excuse to get, you know, colleagues and friends, you know, they want to come around and just sit, sit around the bar for a few hours and, and, and talk football. But yeah. uh, I, I only, I think if I was to commit to doing something every week, it, it would probably lose interest for me. Yeah, and, right. and, and I don't think I've got enough interesting stuff to speak to people about. You know, there's, there's plenty more experts in their field who, you know, can talk every week. I only tend to put stuff out when I think that there's, there's something to say or that somebody who has who is an expert um yeah. wants to come on and discuss some things so it's funny because when we started our, our podcast it was obviously always we did it around and again similar got a man cave around there and we obviously did everything face to face and it was always something we ensured we tried to do and mm. so i don't know whether we necessarily talked about it but we never felt you know over the internet we did an early one with it with a uh, keith in in america but always felt face to face was the way to do it and, and listening to other podcasters uh they're always and, and i'm gonna say you know i'm in, in business face-to-face meetings you get so much more you know value and connection out of that but in fairness it's i'd like to think anyway uh, the, the listeners we have might think differently but certainly having the visual now uh that connection still you know pretty yeah. outside of the wi-fi uh the connection is uh i think the connection is good but i do know what you mean it is far better face-to-face yeah. The, 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 but I'm being impressed even this morning on on this one. The technology is is improving at a hell of a rate. Yeah, you know that yeah. the last online one I did was was a three years ago, I think now, and it, it, that was tough. But I can see the difference in this one already. You know, we, we've we've never met before. Well, obviously Matt, we have, haven't we? Um, but you know the yeah the technology is moving on, and I, and I you know I, I feel like a broken record. I've been pushing podcasts for the best part of ten years now because I. I was, I was doing about 30,000 miles a year on the road in the Southwest and I just got sick of talk sport and the adverts and the nonsense. Yeah. And I thought I can't, it's, I, I look at it now as um, like what you put into your body is what you put. So you take a diet, so you take food and you put that into your body. Well, um, talk sport is like the equivalent for me or the adverts anyway, of putting just constant Coca-Cola down your throat. Yeah, and, yeah, yeah. And, you know, Whereas I wanted to get a bit of a more healthy, balanced diet. It's the same with what you read on the internet and what you, you know, what you listen to. So the, the, we are living in the times where, you know, you can, you can look up somebody and, um, and find out. Every, I read a book uh, by a guy called um, Nassim Taleb when all the pandemic hit. And it's, I've been meaning to read his work for years now. And it just seemed like the right time. And um, I, I went on the podcast app put his name in and immediately found a back catalog of let's say a dozen episodes that he'd done, which then complemented the book. So you get that kind of more depth to, to what it is that you're learning at the time. Yeah, yeah, and it, yeah. it, it's amazing what, you know, you know, you can get. And the other thing with podcasts is that you, you, people can do, you know, you can listen to it while doing the garden or mowing the lawn or driving at the gym, you know, you videos, you, you've got to be, you've got to see it. You can't really be doing anything else. Whereas the podcast, you can be doing other stuff and still benefiting from it. Yeah. I, think, I think that's why they've, they've grown so popular. Yeah. I'm certainly saying Matt and I were talking about before you came on about that drifting and listening to a book that Paul power recommended. And, but I need to be, you know, it's an audio book. So I need to be, you know, super beyond me, but so I really need my focus. But yeah. with a lot of podcasts, you can just drift it. I hope not too many people are drifting out, but yeah. And, and similar to Matt and I, we're big podcast fans, which is ultimately why we started this was because yeah. there's just so much unbelievable, great content out there uh, from a range of people that can give you such great, exactly, exactly as you describe it, great knowledge and great uh, rather than perhaps just media driven. I'm not a criticism of the media, far from it, but 
they're obviously especially in the environment we're in now where you turn on the news and there's only one subject 24 yeah. 7 oh, and it is a nice you just break, need yeah. to kind of get a balance of yeah it's good to know current affairs and what's going on in the world but you also want to want to one one, whether it's just some a relaxing audio book of, of fiction or, or information based stuff. Yeah, and there's okay. something about I think about uh, listening to someone who has who is a genuine expert in an area. Mm. So, for example, a professor um, who you know they go on television, mainstream media. You know, it's got to keep quick six minutes. minutes. Uh, yeah, 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 and yeah. so that expert um, has got literally maybe thirty seconds on a panel to make a point that yeah. is their life's work that they've put thirty years into. How are they ever going to explain that in, in in two minutes? Yeah. So giving those time, giving those people the time to talk and explain, I think is just gives you such a, a broader and fuller understanding of yeah. the concepts that they're talking about. And I, I think in terms of learning and development and education, which I work in, it, there's never been a better time. Yeah. That again, that's why Matt, Matt and I prefer the longer form of. Just, just chatting and yeah. not trying to condense or put down people's people's yeah, view. I, I mean, I'm a big fan of Joe Rogan. Oh, my God. Well, he's range. the reason why. Yeah, he's the reason why I, I, I pulled the trigger because I, I, in fact, I found him because previously I'd I'd been a, a big fan of. Well, I still am a big fan of Tim Ferriss's. Okay, yeah, and yeah. And then I, I, I remember exactly what episode it was. He, he'd done a, a, an episode with a guy called Sam Harris. Yep. And I remember thinking, wow, that, that, that guy knows his stuff. I want to I wanna know more about him. So I searched for him. This was, I, I remember it was 2016, summer 2016. And uh, the first episode that popped up was this guy called Joe Rogan. I'd never even heard of him. And I get ripped now by my lads because I'm like the, the, the biggest Rogan fan there is. I've, I haven't missed an episode since about number 600. Right. I, I get to, you know, travel a lot in the car and what have you, but yeah, yeah. I, I just think that that format is, is fantastic. And yeah. probably the, the reason why he's been so successful is he gives people time to think and to breathe. Yeah. Yeah. I've, uh, I don't listen to every episode more again, probably a time aspect of things, but, uh, yeah, just like the broad range of different, you can be speaking yeah. to an MMA fight one day, which is still interesting and technical. And then the next day, like you say, he's speaking to a, you know, a dietitian about whatever, you know, yeah. for the next day where he's yeah. chatting to Tyson. <laughs> I know it's just why it's crazy, but it, that there is something about people who have, you know, reached the pinnacle in their, their domain and just, hearing that, that especially academic expert you know practitioners so professors Stephen Pink is a really good one um, right. uh, or there's a, a guy and a, it's killing me this because I recorded this episode with him about two and a half years ago now and it's actually sat on my laptop on the hard drive and I've not released it yet it's right. a, it's a three hour co uh, conversation with professor Chris Cushion so okay. he's professor of coaching and pedagogy at Loughborough University and the, the guy is you know um, in terms of the, the academic world of coaching, he's up there with the best. Uh, and I'm, you know, keeps promising me that he'll give me the green light to release it because oh, right. obviously being someone of that, uh, of that caliber, you know, he, he wants, if he's putting his name to something, he needs to know that he's happy with, with what's going out there. Yeah, but of course. they, they speak with such an economy of words. It, it, I think that it, it really takes you to get to that level to be able to talk like that. Um, and that's what I've enjoyed the most about it in, in terms yeah. of being on the, on both ends of the, of the spe you know, the receiving end as a consumer and, and then as a producer as well. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And then, so future, what's kind of, you just continue to develop in that coaching role. Have you got aspirations yourself further on or, you know, what, what are your aspirations? Yeah, yeah there's a few, probably not too many that I can talk, talk about. Right. You know, but um, but no, just to continue I, I, develop. I, and Yeah, I, I, this, this, period of time and then obviously what happened um with my dad uh in february has has been a um you know a time where i really sort of hit the brakes and thought about this sort of stuff so you know I, there's there's parts that absolutely love working with the, the, the team that i work with um within the division that i work with the, you know the organization is get really lucky um and and then to work with you know we get to help people teach people to kick a bag of air around the field for a living you know it's not it doesn't feel like a job sometimes so as long as i'm being challenged and um and doing something that doesn't feel like work then then i'm happy um yeah that's why i like chatting to again stuff i've picked off a podcast and, and speaking to people is 
again, similar with the last podcast we had, someone who just continually is not, con- I wouldn't say content with what they're doing. They're content with what they're doing, but they want to learn more, want to push more, yeah. want to continue to develop. And uh, again, it's a, a common theme. Chat, certainly the last few guests we've chatted to, that that's, that's important. And uh, I think it, it's good for listeners to, to think that way, you know, to hear that and then try, try themselves where they don't. And they're perhaps just, is the word, yeah. just, chugging along that you know that self-development self-improvement self-challenging every day trying something new pushing that comfort zone is uh, is so important yeah i read a really good book last week um and i'm a very very slow reader so you talk about learning there's things that i think you can do to accelerate it and i definitely need to get quicker at reading i'm, I'm, a, I'm a quick listener but not a quick reader yeah. but um it's by greg McEwen called essentialism i got okay. through it in three days so that was probably a suggestion that it was quite a good book <laughs> But what it made me realize was that I'm probably, you know, spreading myself too thin. And I think we all do in, in this day and age where we, we are accessible at the touch of a button. Um, and I, I, you know, there's, there's people uh, in, my, in my craft who really do have genuine expertise. So a colleague of mine, um, Ben Bartlett, he, he's an interesting uh, well, I, I, obviously, you, you interview people from from the island, but no. Ben, well, in fairness, is something we want to explore further. So it's just about ben, yourself yeah, trying to mangle or not. Ben is someone who you would really enjoy a conversation with. He's he's one of those who has a real economy of words, but he's he's a real uh, master of his craft. Former colleague, but he he's gone to Fulham hours to be head of coaching down there. Um, so I my own respect, uh, but he he is someone who I look at and go. You know, you, you managed to cut the noise out and really focus right. on on it, on your on your craft, and I, I need to do that better, definitely. Yeah, yeah, okay, interesting. I'm um, generally speaking, and people want—I'm sure you again from chatting to you, getting the impression you'd always welcome people that want any questions or coaching advice or just pointing in the right direction. Oh, people yeah. want to reach out to you. What's the best way to do that? Yeah, I mean, um, I guess I'm on Twitter, so yeah, get get me on there. I, LinkedIn is the wild west. Um, I don't, I, I, I'm still learning how to use it. I was getting all these requests, and I just, I couldn't, I didn't have the time to do them, so I just kind of accept all. So LinkedIn, if you message me on there, don't expect to reply very soon. Uh, Twitter, for my own sanity and mental health, I have a five minute restriction on that a day. So once I've used it for five minutes, the app cuts off, and it. It logs me out, so um, oh, right. okay. that 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 place is a cesspit, really, in, at times, especially at the be. moment. Yeah. So they, 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 there's some, some really good stuff on there, but you've got to have a real critical eye. But um, yeah. Tw- yeah, Twitter is, is normally I'll, I'll messages or um, or mentions on there. I I'll, I'll normally pick up. Yeah, um, that's obviously how we kindly got got introduced. So yeah, or, or good old fashioned right. email, which is jack.walton at the fa dot com. All right. Um, okay. Yeah, email email's fine. Well, we'll stick that in the footer if you don't mind That's as fine, well. Not a problem at all. Yeah. Yeah. No, I appreciate yeah. it. No, I appreciate your time coming on today. Yeah. It's been great. I've really enjoyed it, and it's uh, yeah. it's uh, I guess it's um, restored my faith or given me new in- invigoration to do more stuff like this. Yeah. Good. Good. Matt, do you want to uh, sign us out? Yeah. So wherever you're listening or watching today, please like, subscribe, share, and leave those five star review. Pretty please. Social media, Facebook, we're the M Word Podcast. Twitter, we're Manx Sports Pod. And on Instagram, we are the M Word IOM. So thanks again, you sexy people, for letting us get into your ears. It's Word Out from Martin. And Word Out from Matt.